So we're going to move on to our next question. And that deals more with assessing student interaction with materials. So whenever your students are actually using the materials that we provide you to them, how do you as teachers assess how those students are actually interacting and using those materials? And uh, we'll shake things up a little bit. We'll go with uh, Jin Laoshi, if you can please share your thoughts. Uh, I have to say, my primarily experience on that question is with my AP students. <laughs> and uh, this, well, the Zoom year, of course, we had a lot of frustrations, but also it gave me an opportunity to really reflect on my curriculum. So I actually uh, decided, you know, for that year, I, I wanted to spend the whole year to actually get rid of textbook for my AP course. So, um, well, a lot of, uh, you know, long working hours, a lot of, you know, hair pulling, <laughs> but I think I'm uh, very glad that I spent, actually I spent time to do that. And I want to say in terms of uh, students interaction with material, especially authentic materials, um, I think com coming up with quality comprehension questions uh, might be a key step. Uh, I used to think, you know, we just, just see if they understand. I just come up with questions and say, do you understand the word of this? Do you understand uh, what the main idea of that paragraph? But eventually I think I was staying in a workshop and got inspired by um, Greta Longard, uh, you know, one of my mentors. And she said, um, make sure when you do comprehension, two things, remember to do two things. Number one is you have floor questions and ceiling questions. You want to start from floor questions, but eventually keep in mind, you want to really uh, help students to think critically critically, and, you know, to really uh, help them to facilitate critical thinking skills. And that really helped me to think about questions which you cannot just answer by simply scanning the material. And that actually was the fun part when I give them questions like that and I see their answers that was always like, wow, I never thought about this. And um, I'll give you an example. One uh, chapter we did in the AP class is, uh, you know, the six, AP units uh, are, uh, you know, identities, communities, uh, beauty and aesthetic, technology, contemporary life, and global challenges, right? So in the technology uh, unit, I work in Cupertino, you know, the Silicon Valley. Kids know technology so well. But I want them to think about, besides all those advantages, you know, technology brings to uh, to our life. Are there any, I don't want to say bad things, but disadvantages or problems caused by new technology? So we read an article talking about, you know, in, uh, in, in China, uh, people are talking about trying not to use mobile pay at all time because uh, one person shared a story by saying that he went to a, you know, just a little, um, how do you call that? A little xiao tanzi, uh, just a, a, a senior lady, you know, having a little, you know, along, how do you say that? Along the street selling stuff, right? So he went to buy something really small and he wanted to pay by using the mobile phone. But the lady said, do you have cash? And he asked why? And she said, because if you use mobile pay, the money will go to my daughter-in-law's bank account. You know, the, the QR code is not related to my bank account because I don't know how to do those mobile pay, you know, those modern things. So this person just posted on social media and encouraging people, always carry some cash in your pocket so you can really help people. When I give that to my students and ask them to think about what kind of things we can do here to really, you know, um, help underserved groups of people. The kids are amazing. <laughs> they just came up with tons of ideas. 
and those kind of questions I think are needed for in our teaching. It's not just simply we started from words, you know, uh, sentences, but eventually it's the idea. It's the new thinking we want to put into our kids' mind. And um, so, sorry, I'm back to what I mentioned earlier. One is to always create floor and ceiling questions. And second is uh, always build a um, activity after interpretive. I realized that I used to just stop after they show me, you know, this is my understanding of this piece of reading or, you know, but you spend so much time to find a good authentic material to generate those good questions. Don't just easily let it go. Give students a chance to really, you know, uh, go deeper or, you know, um, using different ways to work around that piece of authentic material. So definitely you can do uh, an interpersonal activity, ask students to share their ideas, or you can create a presentation. I, I know we, we're all very creative. We, we can think of a lot of ways to do it, but the, totally those two um, suggestions, advices from uh, Greta really helped me to think about how I can help my students to interact, to have a more you know, effective, and more um, in-depth interactions with the material. Excellent, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. It really kind of gets us thinking about new ways we can monitor this. So thank you, appreciate that. And so again, the same question, and we will go to Walt Slaushi for this one. And this is again, how do you assess how students are interacting with the materials that you provide for them? Well, I would assess that in exactly the same way I assess or would assess if I could see everybody at the, the uh, webinar here by teaching to your eyes, looking at your eyes, with the exception of my neurodiverse, autistic, et cetera, students who may not make eye contact. I'm an openly autistic teacher myself, so I'm always trying to be aware of the fact that attention looks different for other people. But essentially, with most people, if they are looking up, if they're nodding along, and above all, if they are answering with facility and speed when I ask a question, and I ask a million of them, then I'm pretty sure that they are engaged and they are interacting with the material. Um, we also use group-created or co-created texts for most of our learning. So this is right from the novice, right from day one, right on up. Um, I'm working from a skeleton of language that I know I want them to get you know, either today or in the near future. But I don't care what specific direction that conversation or story or whatever goes in. So the students are contributing details and contrib contributing different things. And also in that way, showing me what vocabulary they want in their own lives, which we can then give them. Um, but I'm still driving towards the, the grammar points and the vocabulary that's the core vocabulary for whatever level they're at. It's kind of like a bus. I always say, I'm driving the bus. I don't care what color they paint it, but I'm still driving it. You know, Also important for public school because if any of us have taught, I don't know, ninth grade boys, for example, they can lead you into deep water really quickly and you can potentially get in trouble with the administration sometimes over some of the things they would like to talk about. Um, so we talk, we relate things to real life. Um, that's the comparisons on the five C's. So that's really important. And also, relating it, and it would be even better with a native speaking teacher who grew up in China, you know, relating it to, gosh, you know, this is something that happened in the U.S., this is how you guys think about it, but this is how we would probably think about this in China, or this is how my mom would think about it, or whatever. Um, and we also discuss news items quite a lot, usually first discussing them, like we had a very interesting discussion, and I know everybody has a polarizing opinion on this, so this was not about the content or the opinions. It was about being able to use language to express your opinions. We talked about Trump's indictment uh, with two of my classes who've had about, I think about 140 hours now. Uh, so we were talking about Trump's indictment and, and that. And then after the discussion was over, we did it with a whiteboard where we could put up new vocabulary and use it, point to it. Then we developed a writing piece you know, collectively, we can do a class writing thing and then move to that for reinforcement. 
And all the time I'm asking comprehension questions and I'm asking for quick interprets. Not translation, believe me, I've been a translator for a long time. Translation means putting your behind down in the chair and working hard to write things out. Interpretation is very natural. It's just my saying, hey, what did I just say? Tell me in your, your best language, the language that comes out of your mouth the easiest. You know, and that gives me a little window into their minds. What were they thinking at that moment? And that way I can give immediate feedback, maybe not to that student, because I don't really do direct correction, but as a class in general, I know, hmm, note to self, need to go over that piece with more input. So essentially, just like I would in conversation, I'm judging my listeners of who there might be 30 or 35, but that's fine. Um, that's what we do. And just trying to make sure that they're with it and making exceptions for those children or, or students who don't show active listening in the same way. I've had autistic kids who in my classes who've had their head down the whole semester and they still acquired. Not as well, perhaps, or as completely as some of the others, but they did acquire language, significant language. So, you know, again, I don't know the answer, but that's what I do. And I love that analogy of I am driving the bus, but I don't care what color the class painted. And it is so true. Not every class is going to interact with things in the same way. And not everyone will acquire the knowledge in the same way. And not everyone will reach the same level of proficiency, but we're giving them the content, we're interacting, and we're making progress. I love it. Thank you. So same question again, and we will pass to Wang Laoshi for this one. And this, again, the question is, how do you assess student interaction with materials, how they're using it, and how they're working with it? Okay. Um, so for a um, Chinese conversation class, um, I would assign like a two conversation topics for students to study on their own first, um, uh, and then have them to take an online quiz as assessment. Um, and then that way I can, I will know exactly how well they master the content and what questions they have. And they also get an immediate feedback from the online quiz that uh, which part they did well, which part it didn't do well. Um, and the, before they attend a uh, conversation practice as a group. Um, and then I'll, you know, during the conversation practice on Zoom, uh, I'll first ask them about their, you know, kind of uh, uh, practice experience and um, um, I'll give them a chance to kind of uh, interact with each other and it, so I can correct them during that process and give them the immediate feedback uh, how you, you, you cannot use it this way or um, the pronunciation is not, not quite correct or you know sometimes it's a more individual it's the students uh, um, uh, habit of uh, pronouncing certain things so that uh, causing a you know a problem in their accuracy in pronunciation. So those are a very one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, feedback so to help them improve. Uh, and after that, um, uh, I'll have them to do a small video project. And this is really just an individual. Um, so in this video project, a student can choose to work with a partner or they want to uh, work by themselves. Uh, as some students, uh, uh, a lot of my students have a full-time job. So um, they would choose to uh, work by themselves instead of have a, a high schooler be their partner. <laughs> so, um, so I give them the options and they would need to demonstrate how to fluently and accurately and appropriately use the five to 10 year words and the grammar patterns in a conversation. Um, which will cover the main content of the lesson. Um, and let me post, you know, there's a demo I made for my um, uh, SIG group. Um, so if you want to know more information, you can uh, click on this link. And there are several uh, videos to show how I uh, kind of teach online and with some examples there. Excellent. I love that you recognize that not all students are going to have the same experience and you kind of give them the option to work independently. I can certainly vouch for someone who does have a full-time job and is on the grad school track. We love that flexibility. So thank you for that. Excellent. And then passing the questions, definitely not least, but we'll move to uh, Peng Laoshi, passing that same question on to you. And again, the question is, how do you assess student interaction with those materials that you give them? Thank you. Uh, I uh, concur with uh, the what most of the points the panelists are bringing up. Um, I would like to uh, mention two things. Number one is I early on when I was teaching online, I created a lot of uh, videos 
tutorials for students to watch before they finish exercises or be, uh, before they come to the um, synchronous meetings. And the students didn't watch them. I can see their click rate. I can see they probably spent two seconds, 10 seconds on a, uh, the videos I spent hours and hours developing. So they are not watching them. So later on, I used um, Articulate Storyline to create, to recreate my tutorials and uh, require that uh, they complete the comprehension check questions. Uh, it went okay, a, a little better than the first version. And then these days, I'm also using AdPuzzle, um, which is similar to uh, PlayPosit, or these days there, are, uh, there is another one uh, called Fluent key.com so they have a lot of language materials so um you can uh, use some of the videos and create uh, comprehension checks so that's one change or one thing i noticed that's uh, more effective than simply uh videos to present the uh, materials and uh, so that's one way to assess uh, students interaction with uh, materials uh, the second point I would like to uh, mention is the types of questions matter and the, the sequencing of uh, questioning uh, matter. Uh, the questions, for example, based on the text or based on the facts uh, can be included in the uh, add puzzle videos to check comprehension. But at the same time, I usually ask students to um, about uh, informational questions about themselves to engage them. And then they need to bring the uh, answers uh, either in the Google form or in some of the survey or slido.com. Sometimes we do some of the survey in class. Uh, so students have a, um, they each have different um, answers to the same question. So that's kind of a warm up uh, comprehension check and also interaction piece. Um, I agree with uh, Jin Lausch on the uh, floor and the ceiling questions. Uh, so some of the questions, oh, I, I usually go to uh, little questions um, uh, and then which, which they can do themselves most of the time, whether or not they are good readers or uh, readers need uh, some, some help. Uh, I ask them some inferential questions or evaluative questions, uh, evaluation questions. Um, then I assign them into um, groups so they can discuss their answers with the peers before I provide feedback. I think that's very helpful. Uh, once we finish the questions, then it always goes back to the tasks, just like uh, what the uh, other panelists are mentioning. It always goes to the application. Uh, what can we do with the, uh, the materials or the points we learned from the, uh, from the materials? So that's um, my two points. Excellent. And again, kind of letting the students show you well, what are you taking with it? And I like that way to kind of assess getting that right from them, kind of taking it right from the student. Love it. 